All right, Jen. Yeah, you got a public with this one now. So the, Great. You, you get a warning telling you that you're going to be broadcast to the world. <laughs> so, Please. so look out. Well, right. yeah, yeah. And I am going to uh, video manager. Now, where do I find the live link? That bit I can't help you with, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, it's just an image. Bad. Oh, I think I found it. There we go. Now people can join us streaming live. Right. Right. That's uh, require a certain amount of multitasking, doesn't it, Plan when yeah. you hang out? <laughs> so which screen am I on and which one am I doing? online, so that's exciting. Who actually organized these ones this time around? Um, Eric Kurtz is the, the person oh. that I got most of the communications from. Okay, yeah. Because the last one, they um, when they first did it, um, Google organized it, and they, you had a Google moderator in it all the time, and they do this little bit of spiel about Google at the start. Oh, wow. Um, but it's, I mean, I'm really, it, it, it's, it's impressive that you guys have kind of put another one together quite so quickly after. Um, Such a great way to do it. There's a lot of variation and there's a lot of things. I almost want to kind of have like four screens running at once on some of them. I know. <laughs> but I mean, the good thing about you on air is obviously it goes, it goes uh, gets loaded up again later on, doesn't it? So you can always go back and check them out later. Um, it does. It does. Yeah, I mean, between these kinds of PD presentations and then, you know, all of the hashtags that you can do on, on Twitter... Just yeah. kind of, even if you can't be there for them, you can read through them later. They're just, there's some familiar. Yeah, yeah, it's something I've been trying to push for ages. I mean, I, I, in the last, I've just recently changed roles in the department I was in before. Um, I think I was about the only one out of 15 of us that used Twitter on yeah. any kind of basis. Wow. Um, yeah, it's, um, we're a conservative nation by nature, aren't we? It's, um, we don't change very quickly over here. You know, I there are a lot of people over here that don't change change quickly either. It's just there are so many more of us that it's. I think it it looks like we're changing a lot faster than we are, and you know, right. it takes a while, and then all of a sudden there's this exogenic shock that happens. Yeah, um, I think mean, I mean you get to that tipping point where at the you know it's I saw a really interesting graphic about early adopters and then how it gets to a point where. You kind of have to get on board, otherwise you do, you, you start to notice you're getting left behind. Right. Uh, right. And I think, I think in terms of education, I think Twitter is going to approach that point in a not too distant future. Um, mm -hmm. So it'd be it'd be interesting to see everyone then running around playing catch up. Yep. <laughs> you can almost kind of sit there with a certain amount of self satisfaction. Oh, I did try and tell you this I years ago. <laughs> But we'll see what they come up with. Well, I think it's just, I mean, for me, Twitter's gotten so much richer just over the course of the past year. Um, because for a while there, it was just, I mean, it just seemed like it was a whole bunch of marketers talking to each other. Yeah. Um, and there wasn't as much great stuff going on. And now it's just so much, it's so much 
easier to look for things, or I feel like it's so much easier to look for things, and maybe it's just because now I know how to use it, um, but so much easier to look for things uh, by hashtag and just really mm. delve into subjects so quickly, I, and they're coming recommended by people that, you know, I I feel are putting out great content, so... Yeah. I don't know if you noticed that hashtag, I don't know if you, would have got, you guys would have picked it up over there, it was uh, a young girl over here, she was tweeting about her school meals, well she was blogging about them, and she would um, take a photo of her school dinner each day and then give it marks out of ten. Oh, she wow. Wasn't, um, in no way was she being um, unpleasant towards the school or anything else, I mean some of them, some of the meals, um, it's got a hashtag of never seconds. Never uh, seconds? Yeah. As in, never get seconds. Yeah. Never seconds. Because <laughs> um, the local council eventually, because she was encouraged by her school to blog and to get involved in all that sort of stuff. Right. But then it started getting beyond, the, not beyond the school's control, but it grew and it grew and it grew. And it, the blog got passed around Twitter. And very, you know, I, I, I'd go and read it occasionally and look at some of the meals and think, you really can't be serious. You're giving that to a child for a, a dinner. Right. And then one of the local papers got their hands on it, and as papers do, they kind of spun it into something that it wasn't. So eventually the local council told her she wasn't allowed to blog about their dinners anymore. Oh, you're kidding. Well, they lasted about an hour, because obviously this, this hit Twitter, and within seconds it, it was trending top of the list over here for a, a good few hours. Oh, wow. They banned it in the morning, and by lunchtime they'd had to agree that the ban was maybe a little bit over the top. Oh wow! And that, that's the thing about things like Twitter. You know, it's, it's the power that it can bring when it's used in the right way, um, or when it's used constructively rather than destructively. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's yeah, I quite enjoy those sort of things. You watch the, I, I do enjoy the uh, the trending bit sometimes, and you think, oh, I know it's like yeah, I mean, I, I presume you get Justin Bieber at the top of your trending lists as well. Oh. <laughs> And you know, I mean, so many of the trending things just don't don't key into anything that's really interesting for me. Um, no, uh, but every now and again, you'll get one that pops up and it's an absolute corker, and it's never seconds. Because she, um, what she was doing with her blog was submitting. Uh, it was raising money. She monetized the blog. She's only nine, ten. Um, with the aid of her dad, she monetized the blog, but all the money was going to charity, and she was hoping to raise about two thousand pounds. Wow. But because, well, because of all the furore yesterday and all the kind of kerfuffle that was caused by these articles and trending on Twitter, she's now up to sixty-three thousand pounds. That's fantastic. I suppose it's about one hundred and thirty thousand dollars, something like that. Wow. Uh, all going to a charity that makes sure kids are fed properly. That's fantastic. That's so fantastic. that's the power of Twitter, really. That's why. Yep. I, Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, it looks like we've got a couple people in here. So, and it's nine o'clock my time, twelve o'clock Eastern, and five o'clock where you are, right? Yeah. Oh, fun. So let's let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'm just gonna make sure here over in the the chat window that everybody can see the screen. And waiting. Thanks everybody for joining us today. I'm really excited to be presenting about Personalization 3.0 and why learning preferences matter in ed tech. Um, I am the founder of Kidsmit.com, which is a site that's, that's dedicated to helping both parents and teachers understand the ways that their kids really like to learn most of all. Uh, so. With that, I'm going to go ahead and hop on into the presentation. If you have any questions at all during, during the presentation, just go ahead and put it into that Personalization 3.0 session um, in the chat box, and I'll do my best to address them as, as quickly as possible. Um, so the first question that I've got for everyone is, which set of kids do you think will retain what's being taught longer and better? Is it going to be your Group A, or is it going to be your Group B? And oh, all of the oh, all Carla can see is the chat box. Yes, there is more to see. Carla, hang on just a second. Let me go ahead and 
get you the link. Um, and scroll back up here. This is where we're streaming. Oh, great. Thanks, Sarah. That helps a lot, too. Okay, so going back to the presentation, hopefully, Carla, that got you what you needed to get. Um, in terms of what we found in doing a lot of conversation, or having a lot of conversations with students and teachers and curriculum directors and, and principals and parents, um, everyone is echoing the same response, and that is that Group B is the one that um, will retain what's being taught longer and better. And that's exactly what learning theorists have been saying for decades. You know, everyone from Piaget and Vygotsky to more recently, you know, Renzulli and Reese and Christensen and Sousa um, in the mind, brain, and education realm, affectivity really matters in learning. And that's an important thing to remember, especially in our age of standardizing learning, um, that it's not enough to take, or you can't take emotion out of the equation. Emotion is a, is a really important part of the equation. Um, the question is that you've got all sorts of different kids coming from all kinds of different backgrounds and with all different kinds of temperaments in your class, and how do you engage all of them? Um, and everyone, I think, can, can agree that differentiated instruction is the way to go. The challenge becomes that differentiated instruction to a lot of people just means content pacing, where, where you've got your slow kids and your medium kids and your fast kids. And our belief is, is that that is not enough. Um, and part of the reason that, you know, that Harvard and Columbia study that came out in late December of last year found that teachers have large impacts in all the grades we analyze. You know, they, they studied a million students over the course of 20 years. It was a huge longitudinal study. And they found that the quality, the impact that a quality teacher had on the lifetime earnings of a child just with one year was $50,000 or 50,000 US dollars. Um, and that's something that, that you aren't getting just from the online tools. And part of the reason for that is because great teachers have high EQ. And what I mean, mean by EQ is that um, emotional intelligence quotient. Uh, they're really able to key into the personalities of, of their class and um, the individual personalities of their class and of their class as a whole and really tailor and tweak that instruction in a way that is going to be engaging for the bulk of their students and when they're helping struggling students they're really keen into what um, who those kids are and how they learn best in order to get them to a place where um, they can teach them what they need to know. So. We've been asking over the course of the past several years um, whether they be teachers or parents or curriculum directors or principals or students, what makes a great teacher? And like I just said, everyone's echoing the same response. Those superstar teachers have the high EQ. Um, and Education Week is starting to take notice as well. Uh, and that's actually what we're talking about today with Personalization 3.0. And what Personalization 3.0 is, is that we're helping to make sure that technology and data are there to enhance the relationships that occur in learning. They don't pretend to substitute for them. Um, so you're going to start seeing a whole lot more tools out there that really look toward how, how technology can improve those relationships. And we like to say at Kismet that we're e-harmonizing education. Um, you know, there's been a lot of effort on standardizing, and now we're working on e-harmonizing it. Uh, personality type matters. I think everybody can agree personality type matters when you're choosing a spouse, or when you're choosing a career, or when you're choosing your friends. Um, the thing is, is that personality type also matters in learning, whether you're talking about teacher-student relationships, or student breakout groups and peer relationships, or the, the parent-student dynamic. Um, all of those facets matter with respect to learning, and they matter as early as kindergarten. And I think anyone who is a parent can, can agree that, boy, these kids come out with a personality from the very beginning. 
um, and what they enjoy and what they like to do and what they're into is very different from child to child. So um, keen into who they are really matters. Uh, and Kurt W. Fisher, who's the director of Harvard University's Mind, Brain, and Education program, agrees as well. He's, you know, he was just quoted in Ed Week uh, last week, or I guess 12 days ago now, that as saying kid, different kids learn differently. Um, how differently? I like to call this the the education or the elephant in the education room, where you've got all these kids coming from all these different perspectives, um, looking at core concept in different ways. So you've got some kids who are looking at the, the core concept and saying, I see it this way, and other kids who are looking at the core concept and saying, I see it this way. And so in order for a teacher to really effectively introduce uh, core concepts to their kids, they need to acknowledge all the different viewpoints that those kids have and all, all of the different worldviews that they've got. Um, Here's an example of, you know, you've got your extroverted kids on top and your introverted kids on bottom where the extroverts, you know, the little boy in the orange shirt, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, um, the little boy in the orange shirt, that's how extroverts feel after they've been around large groups of people. They feel really energized by that interaction, whereas um, the introverted kids feel more energized by ideas. And if they've been around a, a large group or a group, big group of new people and, and kind of engaged in learning that way, then they are going to need to, they're not going to be energized the way the little boy in the orange shirt is. They're going to need to have time like this little girl in the pink shirt where, you know, they're kind of by themselves and, and they need to regroup and recharge that way. Um, and I think we can all agree that these are very different kinds of kids, but the way that that impacts their learning is very different. For an extroverted kid, they're really energized by action and interactions with other people, and their learning progression is one of attempt and then discuss and then reattempt, and they find it challenging to quietly concentrate for long periods. Um, also, in group discussions, you'll find that the extroverted kids' initial thoughts aren't always well thought out, but verbalizing helps them to flesh out a response, and they can understand concept better when they can participate in a discussion or listen to a lecture first and then thoroughly read the material afterwards. So, you know, one of the things that I like to talk about a lot is that um, flipping the classroom works tremendously well for an introvert, and I'll talk a little bit more about their learning progression later, but for an extrovert, having to read everything first and then come into the discussion process um, is, is much more challenging for them. So that's one of the reasons that you really need to start getting the parents involved if you're going to flip your classroom, you need to get the parents more involved in um, how their kids learn best so that they can have the discussion with the child the night before and the, the child more prepared to enter the class discussion um, more effectively. Uh, from an introvert perspective, you know, in characteristics of introverted kids, they revel in reflection and they get energized by ideas. Um, and their learning progression is much more reflect and then attempt and then reflect. And they really prefer that depth to breadth. Um, and, you know, in a group discussion, they'll prefer to process a question first before volunteering an answer. Um, and they'll, they'll understand concepts better when they can read the lessons or books or texts first and then participate in a discussion later. So as you can see from the slide, very different. Um, but the, it's not just limited to extrovert and introvert and how they process things differently. You know, you've got your sensors and your intuitives. And, you know, these are... It, at Kismet, we, we go to the, the Jungian level of personality type. We don't take it all the way to the Myers-Briggs 16 types. It's just really the eight types of kids. Um, but, you know, you've got sensors who form perceptions based on what is versus intuitives who really perform their perceptions based on gut feel. So when you're planning lessons, it's really helpful to get a sense of whether you've got a predominantly extroverted or uh, sensing class or whether you've got a predominantly intuiting class. Um, and that's just because, you know, if you've got a predominantly sensing class, you're going to want to put together lessons that use the kids' five primary senses to interpret the world. And, and rem they'll remember facts and specifics better. Um, and they're most engaged when, they, when they're practicing skills that are already learned and they're passionate about information gathering. On the other hand, if you have a predominantly intuitive class, those kids, you know, they rely more on their sixth sense to interpret the world and, and prefer to focus on what could be versus what is 
Um, and they work better with general guidelines and specific directions. And you really need to help them key into those facts and specifics because they'll tend to gloss over them. Um, and they get more excited about tasks when they can be approached creatively. Uh, so again, very different from a sensing and intuiting perspective. From a judging and perceiving perspective, these are sort of your, your judges down at the bottom are your um, tortoises, in, the tortoises in your classroom, and your perceivers are the hares in your classroom, where, you know, for your judges, it really is a slow and steady wins the race kind of, kind of exercise. You know, they're organized and purposeful and decisive, and they like to focus on what's the next step, and they like to follow the rules. And they really approach assignments like an endurance runner with the self-control to work at a certain pace to get done by a, spe a specified deadline. Um, and they tend to be your perfectionists. They, they like to prefer to color, or they prefer to color within the lines. Whereas your perceivers, on the other hand, they don't like to separate work and play. You know, play-based learning is a really great approach for a perceiving class, whereas project-based learning is a really great approach for a more judging class. Um, you know, your perceivers like to break the rules. And they like to approach assignments more like a, a sprinter because they're energized by, you know, the pressure of that looming deadline. And you know, they tend to be the ones who like to make their own lines, not color within the lines. So again, very different ways that you can approach the class from a judging and perceiving perspective. And then finally, you've got your thinkers and your feelers. Um, and if you've got a predominantly thinking class, then, you know, they are going to be stimulated by competition and problems to be solved. They prefer cause and effect assignments and decisions. Um, they focus on the environment and the effect on people and what will this impact and why. They think and judge in black and white. They, va they value consensus. And they value consistency in applications of rules and standards in all cases to all people. Um, whereas your feelers will often make decisions based on emotion instead of logic. Who will this impact and how is the question that they ask um, versus the, the thinkers that focus on what will this impact and why. Um, they're prone to interpreting no feedback as negative feedback, so you need to be really aware of that as a teacher. And they work hard to win the approval of peers, teachers, and parents. And they think and judge in shades of gray, and they value consensus. So you're going to have a more cooperative class if you've got a feeling class, and you're going to have a more competitive class if you've got a thinking class. Um, and so as you can see, this, this knowing or getting a sense of these insights for your kids at a class level as well as at an individual level will really help you to enhance your lesson planning and, and tailor and tweak those lesson plans in ways that fit the learning preferences of your class. You know, one of the things that we like to talk about a lot at Kidsmet is that you've got kids in school for a thousand hours a year and they're doing 10 minutes per night of homework um, per grade. And, or at least that's the, the, the generally accepted level of homework for, for most of the kids. Um, so what are you doing in your classroom to make sure that you're inspiring kids towards self-directed learning in the hours they spend outside of school? You know, they've got 4,000 plus hours that they're spending outside of school awake. And are we doing things in our classroom to make them say, hey, learning is fun, let me let me dig in more or um, learn more about other things when I'm outside of school? Or are we teaching them in school that learning is not fun and so that as soon as they've got to those 4,000 hours of free time outside of school, are they avoiding learning activities instead and, and learning opportunities? So I think that's one of the things that we need to be really cautious of and cognizant of. Um, and these, these differences that I talked about in personality type um, for the kids, this is why it's so crucial from our perspective to get the parents engaged <coughs> in, excuse me, <coughs> in helping understand how to better assist their, their kids with homework in ways that really celebrate and embrace their spirits. Because, you know, just the same way that different kids learn differently, a lot of times the parents will learn differently than the kids do. So it's really important for us to um, help the parents understand how those kids uniquely learn best because if you can't differentiate instruction to a level that encompasses what the kids are, 
who the kids are in your classroom and during the school day, then you need to, the, the parents need to kind of pick up the ball where they left out. You know, Jamie Vollmer has talked about how over the course of the last 50 years, the schools have been, have, have taken on a greater and greater role in raising our kids. And now I think it's time for the, the pendulum to really swing the other way and for us to start really looking at um, how parents can be more involved in teaching our kids and, and um, helping to kind of round that side out. Um, which approach will click with each class? It really depends on personality type. One size does not fit all. And just because you have a great experience with um, a, a new teaching approach with a class one year, it doesn't mean that that is going to work for your class the next year. Um, because the class mix will change and, um, and their tendencies and, and temperaments will change. So it's the same way that, you know, when you teach a lesson plan one year and it just goes over like gangbusters and you're really excited about teaching it exactly the same way the next year, um, and then when you, when you do it, it doesn't, it doesn't work as well or, you know, the kids aren't as into it as they were the year before. A lot of times it's not that it was a bad approach, it's just that it wasn't a good match for the class mix. So um, knowing, knowing the preferences of these personality types really helps you to say, okay, here's the core concept that I'm teaching and here's the approach that I'm going to take with this particular class on this particular lesson. Um, Temperament-based insights, like we've talked about, can help shape lesson plans, engage parents, and design those IEPs and RTIs. But they're really just the beginning. Um, better relationships and, and really enhancing those EQ, uh, the EQ for teachers, also helps those teachers better contextualize and chunk new knowledge for the kids. Um, you know, knowing, knowing what your kids are into and knowing what they're not into on the other side will really help you to um, plan lessons that key into the learning preferences of the kids. You know, for one of the examples that I like to use a lot is, you know, when you're teaching the state names. Um, a lot of us learn the state names by saying Alabama, and Alaska, Arizona, Arkansas. It kind of goes on from there. Um, and the real challenge is, is that if you don't have a very musical class, that's probably not going to be the best approach for them. But if you do know that they are more um, visual spatial learners, then you might try something that's more geography-based and, and puzzle-based in terms of learning the state names. If they are more, um, if, if they're more naturalist kinds of kids, then you might want to look at keying into the, the state flowers or the, um, the state birds or the state trees and, and kind of the reasons why each of those, um, each of those happens. Um, and this is something that the Finns do and that we should really be taking note of because, you know, as everyone knows, the Finns are the ones who are uh, best in the Western world and, and on all of those standardized test scores. And for them, the first six years of, of learning aren't about academic success. It's about being ready to learn and finding your passions. Um, and they're really keen into those learning preferences. Um, I'm going to get into Q&A now and then I'll... I'll wrap up right after the Q&A, but does anyone have any questions at this point? We've got a very quiet group. Okay, which I'm going to ask over here in the chat roll, um, is there anyone that would, would like to, um, uh, that would like to talk about how, you, how to structure breakout groups based on learning preferences? All right, I haven't heard anything back, but I think I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the things that can really help uh, teachers with curriculum, at, you know, with the, the growing class sizes is putting their kids into breakout groups. And again, like we talked about at the beginning, um, there's a lot of challenge that happens with um, the putting, putting together breakout groups based on 
the the pace that the kids are learning. So you've got your your slow group and your medium group and your fast group. Um, but but so much of what we talked about, you know, back on that that education elephant slide is that these kids are all coming from different perspectives. So if you can key into those personality types when you're structuring your breakout groups, um, then that's a really effective approach to use to sort of pull ground their the kids in their in their knowledge um, and then pull them out a little bit faster. So the way that we recommend breaking out groups for intro level lessons is making sure that you're keen into multiple intelligence first, um, where you're placing at least one child with um, a real affinity for that particular subject matter in each of the, the breakout groups. Um, and then at an intro level, you look at extroversion, introversion for the reasons that we talked about earlier in the presentation, which is um, helping to, um, it's, an, it's especially important during an introductory lesson because while extroverts like conversation layering through interruptions, um, introverts require concentration and, and well-meaning extroverts interruption may set them back to square one. Um, so it's really important to balance your group so that introverted students don't get drowned out by their fellow students and extroverts have a way to talk through the new information. Um, you know, similarly for intro lessons, you've got to look at that dominant personality type, whether they are um, thinking, feeling, sensing, or intuiting. Um, because using our inferior preference feels uncomfortable, we don't practice it or naturally use it well. And putting it to use can be stressful, especially if we're in a group with others who are adept at the opposing type preference and just can't understand our point of view. Um, and because of these factors, placing a student in a group at an intro level with a, an opposite dominant type preference means that the new understanding won't be contextualized for them in a way that, that they will both absorb and retain the information. Um, and then, you know, at, at the intro stage of the game, it's not as important to judge, break apart your judges and perceivers as it is during practice lessons. Um, and then kind of moving into practice lessons, you know, you want to start looking during the practice stage at, um, at breaking apart by judging and perceiving because perceivers are focused more on what's the end goal versus a judge's focus on what's the next step. These approaches can be really annoying to each other during a practice session. Your judging groups will probably try and come to a conclusion as quickly as possible and then move on to next steps um, where they think we already know enough to make this decision. Whereas perceiving kids, on the other hand, like to drink in as much as possible of, of the situation before time is up to come to a conclusion. Um, I don't know enough yet to make a decision is a more typical response from these groups. Um, but they may have explored more of the peripheral concepts of the topic when you come back to a group wrap up. Um, another way to look at this is that the judges will be more interested in concept depth while perceivers are more interested in concept breadth. Um, and then at a long-term project stage, you really want to take a look at creating more holistic and heterogeneous groups so that that way they get a really balanced view of the concept and, and are seeing things from a different variety of perspe perspectives. Um, you know, it's, during that long-term project, it's really valuable to have the group see all sides of the elephant. But by balancing the, the different dominant types within a group, you can ensure that the group won't feel that one view is right while the other, while the other perspective is wrong, um, and that they all kind of weave together to form a more complete picture of the assignment. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we do at Kidsmet is, is plan those breakout groups as such. So I'm going to go ahead and show you kind of how we do it. Um, I'm going to bring you into another tab here momentarily. And please feel free, if you have any questions at all, to um, go through in that chat role and, and let us know any questions and, and we'll, we'll dive in a little bit more. Um, I've got a quick question for you, Jen. Sure. Um, do you guys over there, actually, as a matter of fact, check out kids' learning styles when they are their sort of their preferred learning styles when they start at school or, or as they're going through? Is that kind of like a, a standard thing? Because I mean, I've come across situations here where um, I came across one young kid who was on the verge of being thrown out of school. Purely right. Because, um, and purely because he's, he, that for things to make sense to him, he has to kind of get his hands dirty, so to speak. 
he's very much the active kind of person who will dive in and wreck something and then ask the question, well, why did it break? Um, right. But see, over here, we still tend, if we do any kind of checking at all, as far as I'm aware, those that do still look at the um, the standard VARC, uh, visual, active. Right. Instead. So if we do have any kind of um, learning preference checking, um, it's based just down those four channels. And I don't, I don't know of anywhere that has it as a, if you like, systematic policy to check. So I remember asking or having, having the parent of this child ask the school, were they aware of what kind of learning style her son had? Right. And they had, they had absolutely no idea. They'd never checked. They had no concept of how his learning style might affect his behavior in the classroom. Right, and yeah, I mean, and that is such a, a key point because, you know, the VARC strata, it just, it, it starts to get into these learning preferences and, and there's been a lot of um, talk about how they don't necessarily matter as much, but I, you know, from my perspective at least, they're looking at um, those learning preferences from the wrong angle, they're looking at them more as an entry point and something to use at the very beginning and to use exclusively, whereas really if you look at a lot of the research out there, um, you need to use all, all the different kinds of preferences initially, um, or, or all those different modalities initially, but you use the, the learning styles, or the VARC learning styles that you're talking about, more in terms of ways to cement and kind of file that knowledge um, so that that way they can access it more effectively. Um, and to your question about uh, whether or not we're using them frequently over here, we're just starting to. Um, yeah, a lot of people have been using them for a long time, right? I should rephrase. There are a lot of people who have been using learning preferences for a long time um, and di different kinds of learning preferences. Um, I think, it, you know, you can go out and, and find a variety of different approaches to the way that kids learn best. Um, and some teachers use it at a teacher level. We've found some curriculum directors that are uh, really keyed into this, this type of approach and you know some other principles that are. It's not a universal thing though. Um, it's, it's starting to gain traction. Um, okay. And I think that you know in large part there's a lot more acknowledgement that, you know, eHarmony has done, has gone gangbusters because they're really keyed into how different temperaments fit together and how to um, better manage those relationships. And, you know, you see it, we've been using personality type tests and, and Myers-Briggs for years in our career centers. Um, it's just sort of aging it down a little bit more. Okay. Um, does anybody else have any have any questions? Looks like we've had people kind of coming in and out. Great. Well, why don't we why don't we, we talk here for a little bit longer? Um, actually, I'll show you how um, our breakout group app works, just so that you can get a good sense of it. Um, but we use those same principles that I just talked about for intro, practice, and long-term projects to really help teachers break those groups out as quickly as possible. So, for instance, you know, if you've got a team size of four that you're looking for an intro lesson in number smarts, and you say, okay, well, Ruben's absent today, um, they can use our app to go ahead and break the, the kids. Um, and they'll give recommendations based on what that group looks like to help tailor and tweak lessons um, accordingly for each of the groups. Um, as you'll see in here, we've got both the primary and the secondary learning styles. Um, the one that starred in each of the groups is uh, a group that is keyed into the, um, or it has a strong preference for that particular multiple intelligence. Um, and then the, the um, personality types all mesh at, at an, in, a, blah, 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 in an appropriate way for those groups. So, you know, for team one, you have tips for auditory learners. Team two, you'll have tips for perceivers. Team three, you're having tips more for the judges. And um, team four, you're having tips for the sensors. Um, so tools like Kidsmit can really help to make sure that 
when you're using breakout groups, which is, is so important in, the, in today's larger class sizes, that you're breaking them out in compatible ways and you're doing it at a, at a level, um, at, a, at a granular level that you wouldn't necessarily be able to do on the fly um, manually. So you'll find that in, in talking to a lot, or we found that in talking to a lot of the different teachers, you know, they like to use breakout groups, but so many times it's more of a either separating them out by um, slow, medium, fast, or they'll just count off and they'll say, okay, well, we're going to do eight groups today, you know, everybody count by eights, and then those are your groups. Um, and there's definitely a, a different way or a different approach that you want to take if you're going um, to help that lesson stick better. And I'm going to come back off the screen share and then I figure we can probably just talk for the rest of the session if you want to. Well, it, it's, uh, it's an interesting, I, I, say, I often wonder how you, um, Uh, we talk about a one-size-fits-all, and we've got all these 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 intermingled groups, etc. Um, right. It's. I suppose it's at what what stage do you think um, pupils, what kind of age, would they kind of be aware that actually their journey is is different to the person they're sitting next to? So how do they how do you get them to take into account that maybe the person sitting next next to them isn't listening to their opinion or isn't taking part. They're just taking it in a different way. Right. That makes sense? That yes, kind of absolutely. And, you know, I mean, I think the earlier that you can key into that, the better. I think that that's, you know, at least for in my family um, and with my kids, they're really aware now, um, and, and they are seven and three. They They've been aware as early as, as I think my daughter was able to talk, she was, she was aware that she was different than us, um, than mom and dad, and that she was different than some of her friends. Um, and, and then when her brother came along, she realized that she was different from him as well. So, you know, I think that there's a real awareness of that in the kids. Um, and one of the things that we need to do a better job of in schools, at least in my opinion, is really having the teachers acknowledge all the different kinds of smart you can be. And it's not just a, a multiple intelligence way of defining smart. It's, you know, some people are really great at planning. Um, like your judges are really great at planning and your perceivers are really great at exploring the peripheries of things and making sure that you're not jumping to conclusions too quickly, um, but that you're kind of staying in that, that um, what could be for longer. Uh, just the same way that, you know, you've got sensors who are exceptional at systematizing things and improving processes, um, whereas your intuitives are so much more exceptional at, you know, dreaming up what could be and, and, and looking out versus looking in. Um, and so those kinds of things need to be acknowledged in a school context and they, and at least in my opinion, they need to start getting acknowledged really early, um, just because the earlier that you can start acknowledging how, um, how different we are and how we need all those different kinds of um, smart uh, in our world, the, the, the more cohesive you're going to have um, our next generation and the, the more willing they are, they are going to be to collaborate. Um, so. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, it's, it's a, I wonder if um, if one of the, the problems is that um, would you be placing, or does is, is there a potential for placing more pressure on teachers uh, in the classroom? Um, I should explain. I always yeah. tend to, in any of these sort of discussions, take a devil's advocate point of view. Oh yeah. Of, I find for me that's how I learn. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I could I could see a point where if if for instance you were checking out uh, you you had a process in place um, 
where you were finding out this information about all of your students. I can almost see a point where when someone's observing the class, they're going to be asking you, well, where's your bit for the intuitive learners? Where's your bit for this? And where's your... Right. And I can see that becoming a problem in the... You know, when you think of something as simple as the bark thing, there are only four different bits, and you can right. put that in simply. Um, the more you take these things apart and the more you dissect them, you, I mean, for me, it comes down, down to one simple thing, which is we're all unique. You know, the only, the only right. unique thing is I'm unique. Um, and I wonder how you could effectively, when you look at the current structure of education, certainly in this country, um, how you could effectively incorporate all of those things into a lesson um, and evidence that you've done it. Because that's, that's obviously right. the key, a lot of the time that's the key point, isn't it? It's, it's not about whether or not it necessarily works in the classroom, because there are so many factors. Right. It's whether or not you've, you've planned to at least attempt to incorporate that into your lesson. So you've got a part which is for... Um, the emotive learners. You've got a part which is for the introverted learners. Yeah. Course of events, you never know what's exactly going to happen. And I just wonder how how your lesson plan would end up looking and how many sheets of paper you would need for <laughs> Right, right. Um, you know, I, I that's that, that's where you may that's where it, that's where I could see problems arising in terms of having lots of people buying into I personally yeah. have a problem. You know, I'm 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 always kind of quite happy to hand it across to the students and sort of ask them, you know even using using analogies which have got nothing to do with actually what we're talking about, but just right. for some people I personally quite like analogies, um, and I found that you know a lot of the students you kinda to allow them to understand, actually, there are many different ways of producing information. You sometimes kind of let them produce information in a way that you possibly wouldn't want them to, but just to allow right. them to explore. Right. And I think sometimes you can end up with, I say, you can end up with each lesson plan being almost a, a, a mini book in its own own right. Yep. Um, and you know, honestly, I think that, like I talked about a little bit earlier, this is because there are so many different learning preferences that really exist, um, at least in the ways that we perceive them, um, that's one of the reasons that it's so critical to get your parents involved um, as quickly as possible and help them understand where their child's learning strengths and weaknesses are so that that way they can start to address it during homework time instead. Um, and really also helping, you know, one of, one of the teachers that, that um, uses our, our system has actually told us that she sends the snapshots, the student snapshots that we create, not just to the parents, but also shares them with her students so that the students understand how they learn best and why they may learn differently than um, the, the student that's sitting next to them. Um, and it's just that they're learning differences um, and, mm -hmm. and different worldviews and that whereas, you know, that particular child will be really adept at one kind of approach, um, the student that's sitting next to them to the left may be in, you know, really great and really excel in a different kind of approach. So that can also help them to create study groups that, you know, in again, in off time, um, create study groups where they can look to the students in their class that may have a better grasp of the material or a different grasp of the material so that they get a more complete understanding of core concept. Okay. Yeah. I, just, um, I mean, I, I, I would, I would always give the uh, the readout to the student before I even go to the parents. I think, but that's just me. Um, yeah. I, I tend to always think. I try always to to have every single student has a right to know what it is we're trying to achieve. Absolutely. Um, in complete transparency. Um, okay. And it, it's it's kids met, isn't it? K I D Z M E T. Correct. Right, I'm going right. to go have a look later on, that's why. Perfect, and here I'll, um, I'm going to bring back the screen share and, and uh, get you sort of the different ways that you can can get in contact. Um, uh, so these are these are our different channels that we, we work on. You're on the, the YouTube one today. 
Um, we do a lot on on uh, Facebook, and I tend to go in fits and spurts on Twitter. I tend to do a lot more reading on Twitter than I do producing on Twitter, um, just because those hashtags are, are so phenomenal. Um, and then, you know, one of the things that I would just recommend is that, you know, if you can take a look at how your class likes to learn as a whole um, and just kind of overlay that on some of the other lesson planning sites that are out there, you can, you can kind of go in there with a sense that, you know, if you've got a predominantly extroverted sensing class, um, then you're going to want to be planning more, more group discussions and um, you're going to want to be more based in, in facts and specifics and, and um, plans of attack. And just knowing that will help you find the lessons that are going to be best for your class on sites like Teachers Pay Teachers or on Lesson Planet. So it goes to a, a different level um, when you're seeking out lesson plans or lesson strategies to use uh, than, than you would be able to just based on the, the straight ratings that are on those sites. Okay. Okay. Great. I'm going to take a look. Perfect. All right. All right, well, thanks so much for, for joining and for participating. And um, hopefully we got some, some interesting stuff going over on, uh, on the YouTube end of things. And um, if anyone has any questions or wants to get in contact, all of my, my contact information is right there. So I'd love to, to chat offline as well. OK, well, thanks, Jen. Thanks so much. All right, we'll talk soon. I'll see you later. Bye. Bye.